Good evening, everyone. My name is um, Anthony. I'm the pastor here. It's so good to see all of you here today. Welcome back. For some of you, Rocky, welcome back as well. Uh, today is a special weekend here. At I Can we give our appreciation first to the worship team? That stand by me? Oh, that was nice. That was nice. That was nice. So, it's a special weekend. Number one is men's weekend. So, all the men out there, yeah. Oh, come on, guys. All the men there, yeah. Yeah, all right. So, later during the, um, at the end of the service, um, Nixie is going to come back up, and she's going to pray a blessing over all the men here at IES Encounter. Amen? All right. Uh, secondly, um, we have a not, a, not a special guest speaker, but he's my, talking about men's weekend, there's, you know, one of those men that you have in your life that he's just a solid guy, and that's Arya. He's going to be our speaker today. He's just a man after God's heart. He's always humble. He is super, super talented. There's almost nothing that he can't figure out in terms of like keyboard, making videos, just, and he's a great dad. And he loves the Lord. He's passionate about serving to the next generation and serving his generation as well. He's a good husband. He's a good friend. I could go on and on and on and on, you know. Um, but I'm excited to have my friend Arya. He's going to come up here. He's going to bring the word of God. So can we please welcome Arya? I'll get that for you. I'll get that for you. Thank you, Benz. Thank you. All right. Um, thank you again, Pants, for giving me the opportunity. Pants helped me a lot uh, with the message as well. So thank you for not only, you know, entrusting me with bringing the word, but also kind of like helping me with the process. So thank you very much. So we're going to jump straight into uh, the message today. Uh, so we're going to read from Ephesians 4, verse 17 to 24. We're going to be reading from the message version of the Bible. So can I ask uh, all of us, uh, if you can, to stand up, and we're going to read the Word of God together. And let's read it with enthusiasm. Uh, the, the title of this passage is said, The Old Way Has to Go. So we're going to read verse 17 all the way to 24. So let's read it together. Ready? One, two, three. And so I insist, and God backs me up on this, that there be no going along with the crowd, the empty-handed, mindless crowd, They've refused for so long to deal with God. They've lost touch not only with God, but with reality itself. They can't think straight anymore. Feeling no pain, they let themselves go in sexual obsession, addicted to every sort of perversion. But that's no life for you. You learn Christ. My assumption is that you have paid careful attention to Him, been well instructed in the truth precisely as we have it in Jesus. Since then, we don't have excuse of ignorance. Everything, and I do mean everything, connected with that old way of life has to go. It's rotten through and through. Get rid of it. And then take on an entirely new way of life, a God-fashioned life, a life renewed from the inside and working itself into your conduct as God accurately reproduces His character in you. Let's pray. Lord, thank you, Jesus, that you have given uh, the Bible to us, Lord Jesus. Thank you that you speak to us through your word, through the Bible. Lord Jesus, we just want to invite that you speak to us right now. We're ready to listen and to learn from your word, Lord. Help us so that, we're, so that we won't stop at just listening and hearing your word, but we can also apply it into our life. Speak to us, Lord Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. You guys can all take your seat. Um, I really love the, the title of the passage, of this particular passage in the, in the message version of the Bible. In the message version of the Bible, it said, the old way has to go. If you read it in the other version of the Bible, if you read it in NIV, it will say, instructions for Christian li living. Uh, if you read it in ESV, it'll say, the new life. The amplified version, it said, the Christian's walk. Now, when I read the title... What it reminded me of, uh, the, the, the title of The Old Way Has to Go, what it reminded me of are these signs. I don't know if you've ever seen these signs before. Like moving sail, everything must go. 
right? There is a sense of urgency in the message version that is not there in the other version of the Bible. I don't know how you read the passage earlier or how you view the message, but I want to suggest today that, when, uh, that we need to view what Paul was saying in, in the passage that we just read with a sense of urgency. And on those signs, you can sense the urgency, right? Everything must go because we're moving. We have to get rid of everything. Everything must go before. One thing that the devil likes to use to stop us from taking God's instruction seriously is that he'll try to convince us that it's not urgent, that whatever God is saying to you is not urgent. Sure, you can follow God's way. Everything is good. But do you really have to do it now? Maybe you can do it later. You don't have to follow it now. Maybe you can follow it until you're, when you're settled in life, when you have that dream job. So I'm going to ask you to do something. I want, I want you to participate. So can you say this to the person sitting next to you? That's no life for you. Very good. You need to live a God-fashioned life. All right. Thank you. <laughs> this is the first time I'm doing this. That's actually pretty cool. All right, so we need to live an entirely new way of life, a God-fashioned life. Now, my prayer to you uh, for all of us today is that God will reveal to us areas in our life that He wants us to change, areas in our life that doesn't reflect a God-fashioned life. Much like what you just say to the person sitting next to you, I pray that God will speak to you, will say to you, hey, that's no life for you. You need to live a new way of life. So when Paul said everything connected with that old way of life has to go, I want us to read it with a sense of urgency. Because when the Holy Spirit convicts us, when God speaks into our life about something that He wants us to do, when God gives us instructions, we need to take it with a sense of urgency. So, in order to illustrate why, why we need to take God's uh, instruction with a sense of urgency, we're going to be looking at a story from the Old Testament. We're going to be looking from the story of Samson. We're going, we're going to be looking from the life of Samson. Now, here's life story is famous or infamous, depending on how you want to see it. Uh, I'm sure you've heard about, you know, the, the life of Samson. You know about the different bits and pieces of his life. Uh, we're not going to read the story of Samson together because it's too long. It spans across three chapters. But to help refresh our memories of some of the things that we know about Samson and just to kind of like start off with something light, I want to show you guys a video by a Christian comedy, a comedian, uh, named Tim Hawkins. So can we play the video? So I thought it would be great to do a Bible story about a Bible character from the Bible. <laughs> Hey there, Delilah, this is your ex-boyfriend, Samson. <laughs> Inside voices. <laughs> and I know you thought that lifting weights made me so buff and handsome, you were wrong. It's cause I let my hair grow long, that makes me strong. Hey there, Delilah, you came in while I was sleeping And I couldn't feel you cutting And I didn't hear you creeping out the door You left my hair piled on the floor While I just snored Oh, what you did to me oh, While I was asleep Oh, I'm a Nazarene oh, But you shaved me clean Delilah, you're so mean I killed a lion, big and mean And slaughtered many Philistines All with a donkey's jawbone, that's no lie But now I'm chained up to the wall And I can't cry no tears at all Because they came and gouged out both my eyes <laughs> uh, 
this is a Bible story, boys. <laughs> I'm not making this up. <laughs> Why'd you grab your clipping shears and shave my head like Britney Spears? And now I'm standing here in total shame. You're to blame. People, that's stinking genius. What's wrong with you? Come on! Hey there, Delilah, why did you have to deceive me? And it's hard for me to think not long ago I wanted you to be my bride But you took too much off the sides <laughs> There we go Hey there, Delilah, when you die Just tell the devil I said hi He'll know why. <laughs> oh, it's what you did to me. Oh, now I'm up a creek. Oh, now I feel so weak. You know, I look like a freak. Delilah, you're a geek. Oh, whoa. All right, so now that we, you know, we, we refresh our mind about the story of Samson. So we know about Samson, right? Samson is, he's strong. He killed a lion with his bare hand. He killed many Philistines with a donkey's jawbone. And probably, and, and of course, we know the story of Samson and Delilah. We know how the story of Samson ends. Samson told Delilah the secret of his strength, right? Delilah betrayed Samson and then gave him up to the Philistines. So the Philistine defeated Samson, you know, they gouged both of his eyes. Uh, Samson became their prisoners, he was, and then he was called to entertain the Philistine rulers as they partied to celebrate the victory, but then Samson killed them all as he literally brought the house down. So what can we learn from Samson's story that relate to our topic today? Uh, if anyone during his time know how to live one's life according to God's way, it should be Samson. Samson was not only a judge, but he is also a Nazarite. A Nazarite is someone who took a vow to be set apart for God by not drinking wine, not touching anything dead, and not cutting his hair. So God gave him this great gift of super strength, and Samson knows that God has set him apart to do something special for God's people. So how did someone who is set apart for God end up blind, defeated, and humiliated? We probably can say, like, well, yeah, he, he got to that point because he trusted the wrong person, because he told Delilah his secret. Well, that is true, but if we want to look uh, at his life, his life is more kind of like a series of bad decisions. He made one bad decision after one bad decision, and he kept going on that road. In, in fact, before I prepare this message, I always think that the stories of him using God's given strength, you know, when he killed a lion, when he slaughtered many Philistines, he was doing that because he was defending God's people. But in fact, if you read the story, he did all of those things because he was either trying to protect himself or because of his own self-interest rather than God's. The story of lion goes something like this. Samson went to the Philistine city. He had no business going there. He saw a girl that caught his eyes, a Philistine girl. He went back to his parents and then said, hey, I want to marry this Philistine girl. Uh, but his parents, of course, said, like, what? Can you marry an Israelite? And then he said, like, no, I want this girl. Let's go. So they went to the city to see the girl. And on the way, a lion attacked Samson, right? And then Samson just tore the lion with his bare hand. So Samson killed a lion on a way to a place that he should have nothing to do with. All because, sorry, all because he wanted to marry a Philistine girl. He let his feet wander, his eyes weren't far behind, and predictably, his heart followed. But that's just the start. The story where he killed 
thousand Philistines with a donkey jawbone? Again, a series of bad decisions one after another. So he, he wanted to marry the Philistine girl. He went back home. He saw the lion carcass. Uh, there's some honey in it. He take the honey. He eat it. He shared with his parents. And then he threw this party, probably drink some wine. And then he gives off riddles. Hey, I bet you this. If you can't solve my riddles, you have to give me these things. If you can, then I'll give you these things. And the, the people kind of like get frustrated and then threaten his wife. And then his wife go to him like, why you do this? You know, just tell me the, please tell me the riddle. So Samson told his wife the riddle and then the wife explained the answer to the person. So he lost the bet. And because of that, he had to kill people to pay the debt. And then he tr- stormed off. He got angry, right? And then because he went away, his wife was given to someone else. He went back, found out about that. He got even more angry, and then he started burning crops. And then, the situation, and then the situations got really heated because of this. The people whose crops are burned wanted payback, so they took his wife and his wife's family and burned them. And as a result of this, he killed more people. And then the Philistine got more mad, kind of like, Samson, why you do this? So they attacked Judah. And then the people of Judah like, Samson, the Philistines are attacking us. Why do you do this? So they give up Samson. And that's when Samson killed a thousand Philistines with a donkey's jawbone. Samson started out by making the wrong decision, by being in a place that he shouldn't be, and then led him to breaking his vow of not touching, of not touching anything that is dead not drinking wine, and to a whole lot of mess, and eventually to his end. Now, the devil knows that he might not be able to turn you to, turn you to someone, uh, to turn you from someone who followed God to someone who may be addicted to drugs or to porn or who lies all the time, who cheats, who turns away from God through one act in an instant. The devil knows this. Uh, in 1962, three inmates escaped from Alcatraz. Inmates Clarence Anglin, John Anglin, and Frank Morris tuck heads made out of soap wax resembling their own likeness into their beds, broke out of the main prison building via an unused utility corridor, and departed Alcatraz Island aboard on an improvised inflatable raft to an uncertain fate. Working at night over a period of six months, can you show the video? They gradually widened ventilation ducts opening in their cell's wall. Using saw blades, they found discarded on the prison grounds, spoons stolen from the commissary, and a drill improvised from the motor of a broken vacuum cleaner. They concealed the holes with cardboard and paint, and their work noise with Morris's accordion playing. Much like the inmates slowly breaking out of their jail, using different tools and covering the damage with fake walls, fake wall and noise with more noise, the devil will work through you one step at a time, taking down your defenses one step at a time with all the tools in his disposal. He'll say like, oh, you know, you can, you can handle it. You deserve to let loose in just this one time. It's just one drink. It's just a kiss. It's just this one time. It's just a TV show. You want to know the story. It's okay. Or for me, you're on a holiday. You can play games. It's just one match. One more match. One more match. Oh, no, it's getting really late. Now you can't do your Bible re- one-year Bible reading plan. Oh, you've missed two days. Well, you know, missing one more day should be okay. Ah, oh, you missed two weeks. Maybe it's better to stop now and wait and do it again next year. Right? The devil will use your emotions, makes you rationalize and justify questionable actions just enough for you to be okay with it. Well, this one thing is bad, but it's just this one thing. You know, I'm not as bad as him. I'm not as bad as her. What I do don't hurt What I do doesn't hurt anyone. No one knows. No one will hurt. He'll lower your standards a bit, and then he'll cover the damage with fake walls and noise, make you think that's okay. And that lowered standards will be your norm. And next, he'll ask you to lower it just a bit more, and then a bit more, and then a bit more. And before you know it, you're far from where you were before. 
I think it's kind of amazing that human beings are very good at adjusting to new circumstance. Uh, when Marta and I first got married, we bought this washing machine. We set it up perfectly. We have... Uh, we, we set it near uh, like a water inlet. Everything is working well. And when we move to our apartment right now, we can't place it in a place where we can get water from the, you know, the water. So I, can't get, I cannot get the washing machine to work as it should be. So I just thought that, well, maybe I just grab some buckets, fill the buckets, and then, you know, dump the water from the bucket to the washing machine. So I kept doing this for over a year. I just figured, well, this is what I got to do. This is like the norm. Until I realized that all I need to do is just go online and buy a longer hose for the water inlet, and then I can connect it, and everything is fine, right? But because, you know, I figured this is just the new norm, I live with it for over a year. Another thing is, another example would be like this. Uh, your phone, right? Uh, and you can do this in iPhone. I'm not sure in Android. You can go to the battery and you can check the battery health. So for my phone, even though, like, if I charge it and it says 100%, it's actually not really 100%. If, if it compared to the, how the battery is when, I, when it's new, it's only 80%. So the 100% is not actually 100%. It's only 80%. 80%. So this, these things, you know, our, our, ability, our ability to just kind of like adjust to new circumstances, this is what can get us into trouble. We can forget that life, the life that we're living right now is not the life for us, that the life that we're living right now is no longer a God-fashioned life. We, prob- we may think that, oh yeah, I'm at 100% right now. I'm living my life the way God has called me to live. But then in actuality, God, the devil has lowered your standard a bit and a bit. What you thought as 100%, it's not 100%. So this is, I think, what happened with Samson, right? He had so much potential. He ended up in such an awful place. He did that not because of one bad decision, because he did it one step at a time, one bad decision after bad decision. So if we go back to Ephesians 4, I think this is why Paul said everything, and I do mean everything connected with that old way of life, has to go. We need to be reminded that in Jesus Christ, God has created us anew. We're called to live a God-fashioned life. And everything else that not that's not a God-fashioned life, must go. And this is the reason for that urgency. And then Paul continued to describe the old way of life as rotten, through and through. Uh, gangrene, if you're familiar with the, with the term, is a type of tissue death, right? Caused by lack of blood supply due to various reasons. What it means is that part of the body is dead. And in some cases, it can cause death to the person. So one part of the body that is dead can affect the entire body. And the solution is to cut it off, uh, cut off the dead tissue, whether it's done by the body itself or by amputation. And this is the kind of urgency that Paul is trying to convey. Everything, I do mean everything connected with that old way of life has to go. It's rotten through and through. If you have gangrene that could lead to death, you will not go to a doctor and the doctor will say it like, you know, it's just that one small bit of your body, it's okay. No, he'll, he'll advise you to cut it off. If you know that you have those kind of things, you will want to get rid of it. But sometimes when it comes to our soul, we can forget that it's even more important. That one thing that we keep that is rotting not only can lead to death for our body, but it can lead, it can change the way, uh, it can change our eternity. One thing that we do can affect our entire eternity. So why keep it? Don't let it ruin the rest of you. In Samson's story, it seems like he kept taking three steps away from God and then just one step back towards God. So what about us? What about you? Are you stepping away from God? Are there areas in your life that you let the devil to lower your standard? 
I want to challenge all of us to really take some time to think about this. Take a long, hard look at all the different areas in our life. Can we be strong enough to be brutally honest with ourselves? Have we lowered our standards so much that our standard is nowhere it was before when we first give ourselves to Christ? Or maybe this is the first time that you realize that you are way away from God. You have stepped away from God. No matter if you, right now, if you think you have stepped so far away from God, or no matter, or maybe you caught yourself early enough that you're just only a few steps away from God. God has a simple solution for all of us. And the solution is to turn around. And the great thing about this is that when we turn around, we don't need to retrace our steps to where we were when we step away from God to meet God. When we turn around to God, God will meet us where we are. You, we don't need to redeem all those bad choices, all those mistakes before God takes you in back again. He welcomes you where you are and God, He'll start the process with you right there and then. In Ephesians, uh, again in the verse it said, And then take on an entirely new way of life, a God-fashioned life, a life renewed from the inside and working itself into, a con into your conduct as God accurately reproduces His character in you. So let's turn back to God and let Him work in you. Let Him reproduce His character in you. We have to be willing one last thought. I'm going to close with this. And this is what I like the most about the story of Samson. More than the story of him using the God, his God's given strength. What I like is that even though Samson made very bad choices in his life, God still fulfills, God still fulfilled the purpose he set out for Samson. Even though he fought the enemy of well, he fought the enemy of Israel, Israel, he defeated the Philistines, even though for most of it he did it for the wrong reasons. But God still used that to, his, to fulfill his purpose. That didn't stop God from fulfilling the purpose he set out in Samson's life. And in the same way, this is an encouragement for each and every one of us. In, in our walk we'll, in life, we'll make bad decisions, right? We'll make bad decisions, but that won't stop him from fulfilling the purpose he set out for our life. But then again, that shouldn't make us complacent with, in our walk with Him, in living His way, in living with the kingdom mentality here on earth. It can help but think the kind of impact that Samson could have done with the gift that God has given to him if he had lived a life that is set apart for God. Now, you may think, but what kind of impact I can have in my life? I don't have Samson's gift of strength. If you do, please let me know. I want to because that's awesome, right? But God has given different gifts in, to each and every one of us. But what I want to highlight the most, and I think the, the song captured this perfectly, is that the one gift that God gave to each and every one of us is the gift of life, the gift of salvation, this amazing love that this king died for us. Our lives and the salvation we have in Him is His gift. And the fact that He has called us to do good works that He has prepared in events for us to do, that God has a plan for our lives. Uh, there's a scene in X-Men Dark Phoenix. I'm not going to spoil the story, but uh, Prof. Uh, Charles, Professor X, meet with this young gene, and then he tried to explain about gifts. He gives a pen and said, the pen is my gift to you. And you can do whatever you want with the gift. You can either use it to make stories or draw and what, whatever he said. You can use it to, do, to create something good, or you can take the pen and then stab someone with it. So in the same way, God has given this great gifts to us, our lives, our salvation, what are we going to do with the gifts? Let not, let's not just cruise along in our life, but let's use this gift of life for, for Him. Be ready for amazing things that God can do in our lives when we're willing to let Him renew our lives from the inside. 
when we're willing to let Him reproduce His character in us. So let's not settle for anything else than what God has prepared for us. I'm going to ask the worship team to come back up. And to recap, this is what I want uh, all of us to remember. First one, let's not let our guard down. Let's not compromise for anything. This is how the devil get you to step away from God. Learn from Samson's mistake. Identify your weakness. Areas where the devil is trying to get you to let go. What areas that is rotten. Rot will lead to rot, and it can end with the entire body being dead. Cut it out. Get rid of it. Samson let one bad decision lead to another and to another. Let's not do the same mistake. First one, uh, second one, approach God's teaching, rebuking, correction with a sense of urgency. Get rid of the old way. Everything must go now. Act now. And set a reminder. Do a regular check of your life. Are you living a God-fashioned life? Much like you do medical checkup, even if you feel fine, get a regular spiritual checkup. And to be honest with you, this is not the first time I share this message. And when I, as I'm preparing this message again, this is kind of like a reminder for me. It's almost been a year since the last time I shared this message with the teens. Am I, have I lowered my standard? Have someone in your life that can ask the hard question. Kind of like what uh, Nixie or Jojo said, you know, you're not meant to live a Christian life alone. Get into a community. Have someone that can be accountable, that you can be accountable to. Someone that can ask those hard questions. Third, turn back to God. If you, if you realize that you are away from God, if you realize that you've, you've lowered your standard, turn back to Him. Don't wait. He'll be there. He'll be ready to take you in and begin to work in you renewing your life from the inside. And then have hope. Don't be discouraged even when you fail because God can use even your failure to accomplish the plan that He set out for you to do. And use this God's gift of life and salvation well. So let me pray for you guys. Lord Jesus, thank you, Lord, that your word is great that your word is beneficial for us to teaching us lord jesus to rebuking us lord god but i pray that you speak to us right now that you identify areas in our life lord jesus that we have compromise any areas in our life anything that we keep that are rotten lord jesus i pray that you reveal that to us maybe it's thoughts pattern maybe it's actions or habits whatever they are lord jesus whatever that is rotten in our life identify that lord and lord we want to surrender these areas to you lord jesus we want to cut this out we surrender every part of our lives to you again lord god and work in us lord jesus so that we can become more like you so that we can do the good things that you have set us set for us to do and thank you, Lord Jesus, that even when we fall, even when we fail, you're always ready to take us back in. Thank you that even in our failure, you can still accomplish that plan you've set us for us, you, that you've set for us to do. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for all of this. In your name we pray. Amen. May I please invite you to stand before we close our service tonight. Let's be reminded again of his amazing love for us. He loves us no matter what. Let's worship together. Amazing love, how can it be that you, my king, would die for me? Amazing love. It's my joy to honor you. Let's sing it out. Amazing love. Amazing love. How can it be 
that you my king will die for me amazing love I know it's true oh it's my joy to honor you in all I do I honor you yes we trust in you Jesus Cause you are my king, let's sing it out. Cause you are my king. Jesus, you are my king. Yes, you are. Oh, you are my king. Jesus, you Is you are my king, yeah. Jesus. You are my king. Oh, the old life is gone, the new life has come, and you are my king. Hallelujah, Jesus. You. from today's sermon thank you Aria for that word that oftentimes we feel guilty and we focus on our failure as Samson did that he made many mistakes along the way and that we can't get over those failures but as Aria said you don't have to retrace your step the moment that you turn around he's right there and so don't focus on the failures focus that God is a God of hope and when we do turn around, He will embrace us. He will, both hands, and He'll hug us. But there is something that we need to do. Turning around means stopping what we were doing that wasn't glorifying to God. And the moment that we do, you'll never regret it. The lies is going to be, you're not going to have as much fun. You're not going to enjoy your life as much. But that's that's the lies. So I want to encourage you, as Arya says, to have a sense of urgency to do that spiritual checkup. Thank you once again for your message, Arya. Right now, I'm going to ask Nixie to come up. She's going to bless all the men here at IES, um, IES Encounter. So if you, there's a guy next to you, appropriately lay your hands on him um, as Nixie is going to close out our service and pray a blessing over them. Nixie.
Let's pray. (laughs) God, we thank you that you've brought all these amazing men, God. We just declare Psalm 27, 4, that 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 will be their prayer. One thing have I asked for the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. We just pray that in their lives, God, let it be that just one thing be that one thing, (laughs) not to compromise, to pursue after you, not to be distracted with logistics or making money or all the things that they have to do by God. It's pursuing after your heart. It's growing in a relationship with you. I just break the lie of any expectation. They feel the pressure to be a certain way whether that's what they felt growing up. But God, I thank you that you can heal that broken image. And God, they can follow the perfect image of a heavenly father. May they carry that heart. May they walk with so much boldness and confidence in their authority and their identity as a child of God. And God, we bless them, God, as part of this community as women. We uh, bless them to be leaders, not because of their duty, but God, knowing how to first follow after you, knowing how to serve you first. We thank you that you continue to equip them with discernment and wisdom. Um, And would you bless them in their lives, great accountability between men. And it's okay to be vulnerable. It's okay to feel weak at times. And as Pan said, make mistakes for a human. And there's grace for that. Thank you, God. We love you, and we're so thankful for every person in this room, every man. Um, May they follow after you and know what it means to have um, a godly fear. In your name, amen. Have a blessed Sunday.